This is a review of The Art of the Adventures of Tintin. Admittedly, there was not a single aspect of the movie I enjoyed, but I am a big, big fan of Weta and their books, and so decided to give this one a shot anyway. And boy, am I glad I did, because this is a fantastic book. The author is Chris Guise, or maybe it's Geis or Geese, but I'm gonna guess Guise. Anyway, Chris has worked at Weta since the Lord of the Rings days, and is actually the lead concept designer on the adventures of Tintin. So he's obviously in the best position of anyone to create a book like this. Many a time we've seen that working on the movie doesn't necessarily mean you're capable of writing a great book on it, but thankfully this book's an example of that working out well. Which was something I was confident in when, straight out of the gate, he won me over as a reader with his opening author's note that echoes sentiments I've expressed in countless reviews. So I'll read the start of it here. The way I've written this book is unlike most art of books out there. In the following pages, you'll see many images for things that never made it into the final film. So many times I've read books where they show approved designs which closely resemble the final design, then they show a screenshot from the film. All the design work leading up to that final image is never seen by the public and, as a fan and an artist, that irritates the heck out of me. In this book, you'll see a wide variety of imagery from all steps of the process, blah blah blah, and understand how every design decision led to that final shot on the big screen. So that is just brilliant. Too bad it's essentially bullshit, or at least a grossly misleading exaggeration. Does the book have elements of that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Is it a feature noteworthy of such a bold opening declaration? Not in the slightest. In this book, the amount of stuff that closely resembles what you see on screen is no different to most other art books, and to suggest otherwise is unseemly, disappointing, hypocritical, and should absolutely be condemned. Which really sucks, because despite not living up to that promise, the book is actually really great. So why is the author shooting it in the foot, setting up ideals it doesn't live up to? Plus, throwing down that that gauntlet isn't particularly wise in this case given the nature of the movie, considering that 1. the characters and scenes were already designed by O'Shea 80 years ago, and 2. the vision for this movie was to be as faithful to his work as possible. So there's not a whole lot of freedom in how things are going to look, you know, snowy is snowy, there's not a page of exploration where they played around with him being a husky or a goldfish or something, so it's unavoidable that most of the stuff closely resembles the final product, and in terms of the heavy emphasis on things that never made it into the film, again, there are a few, and they are awesome, some unseen locations and specific gags, but not a lot. Certainly no more or better than most other art books, which is a pathetically low bar anyway. So this opening paragraph is absolute nonsense and the only thing I detest about the book, and this could have been completely avoided and thus made a more positive impression just by omitting that one single paragraph, which at its core is false, probably not appropriate for this project anyway, and just begging for scrutiny. For example, look at this page while I reread part of it. So many times I've read books where they show approved designs which closely resemble the final design, then they show a screenshot from the film. Hmm. Honestly, the only part of the book that truly lives up to the opening and shows what the book should have been based on that promise is the section on Omar's palace, which shows about a dozen varying designs and some unused ideas. But despite the fact that that makes it, unsurprisingly, the best part, it also severely highlights how the rest of the book doesn't do that by comparison. An important thing to know about this book that does make it a little more unique compared to other art books is that there's quite a lot of what we would traditionally think of as making of, which is also explained in the preface, so I'll read that too. I also wanted to explore the world of digital creativity. I feel that too often in the past, this has been seen as just technicians following orders from the real artists. With this book, I wanted to dispel that myth, whether they build digital models, performance capture movement, or create artificial hair on a dog. Everyone working on the design phase of a movie is an artist in some form. The same for the actors and on-set crew. Now, while I completely agree with that sentiment too, I think that for most people, the expectation is that the art of refers to just the conceptual and design artworks, and anything else about the production that falls outside of that is making of. So although this book has the title The Art Of, it does bring certain making of ideas into the fold. You'll see a bunch of motion capture behind the scenes photos and images more to do with technical animation and design, and I think that's fine. Playing with and expanding those definitions to not be so rigid can make an individual book much stronger, of which this is proof. 
but only because it's been very intelligently and appropriately implemented, which contributes enormously to its success. And that's because the movie itself is kind of a unique hybrid of animation and live action in terms of its production, and it's so great to see the book reflect that. But I do just want to highlight this inclusion of digital artistry and animation just so you know what to expect, that it's not just concept art. And so naturally, there's a good amount of text, which in art books I can take it or leave it, just as long as it's not bad text taking up space. But in this book, it's very important and absolutely terrific, miles ahead of the uninteresting driven you typically get in art books. To the point that the text and the previously mentioned making of stuff is what takes this from a three-star book to a four-star one. The text is mostly very interesting commentary from the people who worked on what you're looking at, and the content of that commentary clearly supports the imagery and direction of the book. It's specific and focuses on the hows and whys, i.e. the most important elements for text in any art or making of book. And I particularly liked the focus on the attention to detail and the openness and explanation of the different challenges they faced. Sometimes the how and why are left hanging, but overall, especially in conjunction with the images, a lot of really great, really eye-opening stuff that gives an appreciation of certain design and animation challenges I wouldn't have considered otherwise. But, you know, it's still an art book, so the text makes up the minority and only covers so much. But I'm always so thrilled whenever I finally get to review books that are actually well-authored and worth reading, because those are just inexpensive explicably rare qualities for art and making of books. The book's divided into two major sections. The first focuses on character design and makes up about 40% of the book, and that's where you find a lot of the text and animation making of stuff I was referring to. There's less of that once you get into the second section, which is the environments and more scenic production paintings, which makes up about 60% of the book. And this is really where it starts to become more of a straight up art book. And the art itself is wonderful. The amount of detail, the content of what's being depicted, it's very illustrative and cinematic. Cinematic. I like both of the book's sections equally for their differences, and probably the major thing that stands out as being particularly impressive is how the book achieves a remarkable balance of all its requisite elements, which is the absolute hardest thing to do in making any book. There are a lot of often conflicting plates that need to be spun, and Chris has handled them much more deftly than most other authors are capable of. And of course, this is only made possible thanks to some pretty good layout which has allowed the book to be absolutely packed with content. Although this is prevented from being even better by a lot of poor image sizing decisions, but at least there's not an inch of blank space to be found. It's also cool how they've been able to include the original comic panels for reference and comparison, but keeping them small and unintrusive. In fact, there's a huge emphasis on artworks that recreate the original panels in a style more appropriate for their movie, but although I got a kick out of it and found them interesting, it's definitely far too overused. As for the graphic design elements, I am glad the book uses them and has a look, However, I think the way it's been realized is a little too garish and amateurish, as surprising as that may sound. But that's pretty innocuous. My only other criticism is a continuation of my dissatisfaction with the opening paragraph of the author's note. In this case, it's the use of giant final character renders and stills from the movie that do not need to be here. Now, there's only like 20 stills in the book, which is nothing, and there's not too many final character models, although the close-up detail is remarkable to examine. But the reason these elements are a problem is because not only do they kind of fly in the face of the ideology outlined in the preface, but it's also made particularly aggravating when there's also another note at the end in which Chris laments the thousands of images that couldn't fit into the book, and yet space is being taken up flaunting worthless full-page screenshots. And just like my issue with the opening statement, I wouldn't have even commented on this except for the fact that the author's drawing unnecessary attention to it. So I guess the whole point I'm trying to make with this review is, tear out the front and back author's notes and you've got a pretty terrific book.